It's the same thing for the leader that you're coaching, your client, because their Bible is going to be that leader's guide to involving stakeholders. That's what they need to know and to practice and, and eventually become habitual, where it's almost, you know, you can, it's in their subconscious routine, they can rely on it, you know, for, yeah, for the rest of their life. Where we believe everyone deserves a stakeholder-centered leader. Frank, can you tell me a little bit about how stakeholder-centered coaching came to be? Sure, Brandon. You know, it's like most of these things in our professional career, it wasn't something that was pre-planned and if you build it, they will come. This is something we were doing. Uh, you know, Marshall had invented his approach to coaching by working with some of the most successful leaders there are, but helping them get better. And in fact, he before he was actually even a coach, per se, he was building his fame with an organization called Linkage, where he would give a, one of their keynote talks, and the title was How Successful People Get Better. And he'd come up with this, this sort of formulation of how they do it. And it's really the basis of our methodology of how leaders involve their stakeholders, which is you ask, you listen, you thank, you think, then you respond, you get back to people, you, then you do the heavy lifting and you actually implement what you're hearing and, le and learning and you change and then you follow up with people. And he would give this talk and but he might have followed Colin Powell as an example, because by the way, he did, and, and other luminaries like Colin Powell, who would get at least standing ovations when they finished their talk at Linkage. Marshall always got the highest evaluations. And this is a week-long program people went to in Palm Desert every year. And, and then from that talk, he started getting a lot of this coaching. And so he really kind of morphed into coaching as his, probably his major professional thing as opposed to training. And, and I was involved going in as a coach at Linkage to sit down with some of the participants, go through the 360 feedback, do an action plan. Well, around the year 2000, Marshall was now becoming very successful as a coach, and he landed a coaching gig with a high-tech company in Silicon Valley where they wanted the top 24 high potentials to get coaching. Well, Marshall far out of his bandwidth, so he decided, hmm, I gotta get some other people involved. So first person he calls, Frank Wagner. Hello, Frank, you know, how would you like to coach somebody or four people, a high pose at this high tech company? And, um, and it was also an interesting proposition about um, you're gonna coach them for a year for nothing. And you're only gonna get paid at the end if they get better on something I've invented called the mini survey. Are you interested? I said, absolutely love it. Love the idea, right? I'm a risk taker. I mean, I grew up as a surfer. And I said, this is great. My wife, dumbest idea Marshall ever did in her eyes to this day, you know, 23 years later or more, uh, she still feels the same thing. So, um, so I started coaching, you know, four people. And, and, uh, and we called it Marshall Goldsmith Behavioral Coaching. That's what it was called at the time. Um, Marshall also recruited, um, what? five other coaches, of which Chris Coffey was one of them. And, and we did this assignment. It was very successful. And so then this thing got expanded. So then Marshall comes to me and says, Frank, I want you to train and coach people to coach like me. So because you know, I'd known Marshall since our PhD program starting in 1972. And we were assistant professors of management sharing an office, maybe the size of this little tea house that you and I are sitting in. And, um, so I know Marshall really, really well. I knew what he was doing really well. So, you know, but he told me, I'm gonna coach. So I'm, th no, let me get back up. I was thinking this is gonna be fantastic. We're gonna be like, you know, special forces in the military. We're gonna be elite, small group. Uh, because remember, supply and demand, you know, limited supply, huge demand. We can charge all kinds of money and all this stuff. And this is going in my head. Marshall says, yeah, I'd like to train about a thousand coaches. I'm going, thousand coaches, that's kind of bigger than our, our uh, little elite group. In the next four weeks, he called me every week and added another thousand. So by the time he had finished, he wanted to train 5,000 people. Now there wasn't a time limit. And guess what, Brandon, let me ask you, how close are we to hitting that kind of a number right now? We have about 5,000 as of, about 5,000 as of the end of August, 2023. Yeah. yeah, so in other words, it took about 23 years yeah. to get that many. And, but you know, Mar whatever Marshall wants, Marshall gets. 
right? So we started to develop this, this coaching methodology and training people in, in, in this coaching methodology. The one thing I realized though too is because Marshall, his actual words were, I want you to train people to coach like me. And even when he was saying it, I said, you can't replicate Marshall Goldsmith. We, what we did is we had to come up with a little wider set of coaching skills than Marshall uses. And, uh, and so that will compensate for not being as good as Marshall at his strengths. Now, what are Marshall's strengths? Number one, behavioral reinforcement. He is so attuned to what a leader does wrong and pointing it out to them, by the way, in a humorous way where they'll end up, first of all, feeling like they got hit over the head with a two by four. And then secondly, they'll laugh at themselves. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, how can you teach that yeah, gift? He's painfully right? good at it. Yeah, and, and, but, but we, can, can we have 5,000 people who can do that? I don't think so. The other one was storytelling. I mean, the guy made a career on storytelling. Now, I think we have lots of good storytelling coaches, but still, the ones that can carve it the way Marshall does it, rare. So, so we added some other kinds of skills into this thing. So, you know, things like doing a cost benefit analysis, you know, that kind of stuff, you know, doing, doing things like um, after action reviews or assessments. Those are all parts of our methodology, which didn't exist when we got started, but it was kinds of things we're building in. Chris Coffey brought in behavioral rehearsal, mm. right? In terms of that. I don't think Marshall's never done a rehearsal. He'll, he'll just, he'll say, okay, um, CEO, I want you to go thank, the 360 respondents, here's how you do it. Boom, 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 boom. You know, Good. bless you, go do yeah. it type of thing, right? He behavioral rehearsal. But of course, a lot of people he coached, they don't need behavioral rehearsal. Yeah. They're used to being even in front of cameras mm -hmm. type of thing. So this thing evolved, evolved, evolved. Still up to the, you know, I don't know, I'm going to just say 2004 and don't hold me to this. We were doing training people in Marshall Goldsmith behavioral coaching. You know, as you know, Brandon, probably better than me, uh, branding is important and our brand is Marshall Goldsmith. So guess what? Nice to have that in the title. Then Marshall ends up doing something that was unique and, and didn't last that long, but he actually sold the rights to his name. Mm -hmm. And he sold to Cats and Back Partners Limited. And, and, uh, and they thought they actually had all the rights to his intellectual property. But what they didn't realize is the coach's playbook, the workbook, all this material around the coaching, it was, was uh, copyrighted by three people, Frank mm -hmm. Wagner, Chris Coffey, and Marshall Goldsmith. So they only had like a third of the rights, so to speak. So they negotiated with me for nine months to get the, to, get, to buy the rights. And, and then they paid us an agreement to buy, kind of buy us out. It was gonna go, be over a five year period. And, uh, but you know, I was not happy because I loved training people in this coaching methodology and now I couldn't do it. I could still go do the coaching myself, which I also love. And so um, we sat, Chris and I sat on our heels for about two years, collected a decent check every year on the buyout. And then something had happened. John Katzenbach had retired. Nico Canner, who was running the show, ends up forming a new deal where he sold their company to, I'm going to say, Bain or Boston Consulting Group, one of the big consulting groups, and they didn't want to take the coaching with them. Because, mm. by the way, they weren't successful. They thought they were going to be really successful at coaching. They were more McKinsey as strategy, all that kind of stuff, uh, which they were very good at and doing well, but they never got the coaching stuff really off the ground. So all of a sudden, Marshall got his name back. Now, the one thing, though, that during that period when, when um, we couldn't really use his name, I, I started thinking about, well, what can I call this besides Marshall Goals and Behavioral Coaching? And I came up with the, the concept of stakeholder-centered coaching, which I actually liked. I mean, I, I disliked it that, we, that I was losing Marshall's name connected to it at that time. Yet what I, I really liked about it is it more described what our coaching is all about, because that's one of our unique features. Mm -hmm. It is not one-on-one -on -one coaching, it's, it's many-on-one -on -one coaching. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not just an external resource, it's using the resources in the organization for the coaching. And so that was a unique proposition at the time. It's still, unfortunately, well, actually fortunately for us, but unfortunately for the world of leaders, it's, it's not exactly commonplace. So, so we called it Stakeholder Center Coaching. Now, since Marshall has his name back, we can call it Marshall Goldsmith Stakeholder Center Coaching. So we have the best of all worlds today. So that's kind of where it all came from mm -hmm. in, terms of, in terms of a background. So. Okay, so you got the rights back to Stakeholder Center Coaching, the rights back to Marshall Goldsmith. 
You put them together. We got Marshall Goldsmith Stakeholder Center Coaching and you get back to training coaches. Mm -hmm. What did you notice? Well, let me also say during that era, how we trained people, and it wasn't uh, even up through that time what we called a certification. It was we were training people in in either Marshall Goldsmith behavioral coaching or stakeholders. And we when we got it back, stakeholder center coaching, and it was a two day live program. Now they would get as a pre read the coach's playbook, because see really the coach's playbook lays out the methodology whether you're using it over a six month or a year long assignment. All you have to do is follow where it is in the playbook, and and by the way someone who's talented could be a good stakeholder center coach just with the playbook. You know, on the other hand, you can have the playbook and never look at it and it's not going to be of, of an asset to you. So um, people would get the playbook with, with the expectation that they would read it before they came to training. Mm -hmm. Guess what? Is that, that was a, a reasonable expectation for people? Not really. Some, some had actually pr printed it out and underlined things, have made all these arrows and all stuff. You go, oh my God, this is a quote, good student. And other people say, oh, I kind of forgot to open yeah. the cover. Right? So people came to our training with, at various levels of understanding of the methodology. And again, that even though the, the, see, the training focused predominantly on skill practice, mm -hmm. so it was the assumption that people had trained. So the one thing I discovered, though, is a lot of people had questions, um, had, uh, I'll just say, not high enough confidence in my mind to be good stakeholders and coaches. So we would get inundated with phone calls. Can you help me? You know, how do you handle this kind of a situation? Which, by the way, that's been on, ongoing. I mean, I've, I've probably handled, let's see, today's Wednesday. I've probably handled four or five coaches this week mm -hmm. around, you know, a couple on the phone, mostly email exchanges, this thing of helping them kind of think through something or what to do about something. So um, I watched uh, an episode last night on public broadcasting. Uh, it was about Ireland and tradespeople in Ireland. And uh, there, was, there was one example was probably one of the most famous, you might say, products out of Ireland is, is Waterford Crystal. And, and they had one of the last guys still doing it in the, the old ways, not with the machines doing a lot of the work, is hand carving crystal, right, with blades. And he showed his wall, he had probably 50 different kinds of little wheels that would be used for this thing. And the guy was a master craftsman. So, you know, people want to get master certified coaches. And well, if you want to be a master certified, um, you know, person, a craftsman at Waterford, you know how long it takes? Mm. 10 years. Oh, wow. And, and by the way, you don't even start your 10 year until you've actually demonstrated you can do it. So, you, you know, if you can't do a certain level of quality, you're not, they're not going to waste their time on you. That's always been my sense is, I mean, I think I'm still getting certified mm -hmm. as oh, a coach. Beautiful. Tell me about that. And the, the well, see, you know, I, first when I heard that we were going to start certifying people, I, I'm a believer in the apprentice model. You learn more by doing than by attending a class or reading a book or that kind of stuff. You learn by doing. So that's why at least to, to make master level certification, we, you have to do 12 successful coaching gauges. And what I love about our methodology, again, Marshall gets all the credit, that we don't get to determine whether a leader gets better, right? They don't get to determine whether they get better. It's their stakeholders by an anonymous survey to determine whether they get better on this thing. So, so th 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 that gives me comfort that because I, I prefer anybody that's certified as stakeholder center, stakeholder center coaching gets master certification, which means they've done 12 successful coaching engagements mm -hmm. on this. So th that's to me is, and it's all ongoing learning. Because, you know, like I say, I, I just had a coaching call right before you showing up for our meeting with a new CEO that I'm coaching. And I learned something at the very beginning of this coaching assignment that I hadn't seen in the 23 plus years I've been coaching. So you, you're, you're continually learning because there's always uniquenesses to, to situations. So, um, you know, in this regard, coaching him, I might say I'm an apprentice in coaching him because, you know, I'm confronted with a situation that's not rudimentary or what's been normal, what I, I, I experienced coaching people. So do you mind telling us a little bit about that at all? Well, OK, well, a little bit about that. This is the first coaching engagement I've had. Now, there are coaches that this is their line of work. It's it's a family run business. Mm. Oh, okay. And and this particular individual who is the founder and CEO has 
five sons and a daughter. Of his children, um, six or five of the six have a direct relationship with the company. Now, the the uh, the oldest son is the chief operating officer and likely to be his replacement. Oh, that's not a guarantee. Then he's got then he's got um, three other sons that that work in the business in various very important capacities, um, and his one daughter. Her husband is their chief financial officer. Wow. So it's a son-in-law, okay. chief financial officer. So, you know, with that, there are certainly family dynamics involved. And by but this is not a small family business. They own, um, you know, 363 restaurants in 19 states. Plus they own other types of facilities like storage facilities. And I mean, this this guy's a, a entrepreneur, uh, serial risk taker, mm-hmm. you know, builds businesses. And and uh, but I, I, I'm not going to get into the specifics of it. But it was you know a situation that involved family. That wow, Frank, are you certified here? <laughs> so I, I I'm continually learning mm-hmm. as we go. Yeah, and we've extended that apprenticeship model into the certification as well. Yes. Yeah. A little bit about that. Well, well, see, well, first of all, I, I am so appreciative of the work that you are much more the springboardist than me, Brandon, and that is which started off in our international business, was um, putting together um, the actual learning component as um, a separate stage and and an initial stage where people go through self-paced e-learning, which by the way is also a modern way of learning, not the old classroom style of learning, which- Just the coach's playbook, right? Yeah, yeah, but see, see, again, I don't know how many people now, if there's anybody who watches this video that says, yeah, I got trained by Frank Wagner in 2007 mm-hmm. and I got a copy of the coach's playbook. Mm-hmm. By the way, unless they, they check in and get a more recent copy, we've made iterations yeah. almost every few years to the coach's playbook. Didn't really change anything, but added, refined things as we've learned over time. The, the, you know, the, the important thing is, is that, is that you, know, you got to evolve w- w- as time goes on. Mm-hmm. And, and so the way our coaching works now is you've got that stage, then you, then you have the school practices is, is a stage which is pretty comparable to what we always did. Mm-hmm. But people are coming much better prepared for it. So, you know, if you're better prepared to do something, you do it better. So, they've, so, they, so I'm more comfortable with people getting through that second stage. But now, even to get the initial certification, mm-hmm. you have to do one successful coaching engagement. The music to my ears yeah. in terms of that. See, I don't want someone to, I mean, I feel, I just say I'm personally embarrassed that, that, see, I never, I never go around telling people I'm a certified in stakeholder mm-hmm. coaching. I don't go around telling people I, you know, I was my involvement per se. And I'm just saying I get to practice something my good friend, inventor, Marshall Goldsmith did about this thing is, is that the people in the, that, that in the old days went around and got out of our two day training, got their certificate and they said, you're certified in stakeholder center coaching. Um, and they're going and saying, I'm certified then I'm a little embarrassed with what product they might be delivering mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. to, to our Now, here's the good news. Our reputation is solid. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm not, I don't lose a lot of sleep over this, but still I would like every coach to be a true master level at applying the methodology. Mm-hmm. That, that, that'd be my dream. Yeah. Well, you know, it's nice you mentioned <clears throat> in our methodology the leader doesn't decide whether they've gotten better. Certainly not the coach, it's the stakeholders. Right. And you have done a great job proposing that we transpose that whole model to say, what if we didn't decide when people are certified? What if the stakeholders of the person they're coaching decide, hey, this coach actually has made the change that they right. are, or that they espouse that they're able to change. Right. Um, and I've seen that be quite powerful, not just from the services we're delivering, but also in the coaching side. And so what have you noticed about coaches' abilities and leaders' abilities as you've gone through a training, um, I would say probably 3,000 or so of our coaches now, right? Well, the, th- the thing is, is I don't want to claim to having a lot of um, data on 3,000 coaches. Mm-hmm. You know, we've actually set this thing up as a, as a network mm-hmm. and they're not employees, you know, so they're not going to get supervision. You know, people are pretty much on their own. They can do what they want. I can say that there's there's a certain number that have stayed very involved with us in terms of the network and with each other and with us. And a lot of, you know, I'll tell you, the perfect example is anyone who's watched season one of Conversation with Coaches um, and the coaches that were interviewed are these types of people that I'm referring to. And, and 
and I'm sure new people working with them, any of those people will just go, oh my God, I want to be just like them. Yeah. You know, I knew them when they, at least in Sacred Center Coaching, they were not like them. Mm -hmm. They evolved into that. You know, you, you learn by doing. Mm -hmm. You learn by, from experience. Mm -hmm. And you learn, just like our leaders do, you learn from feedback and feed forward mm -hmm. on what you're doing. So, you know, the thing is, is that, you know, I mean, I've learned a lot. And Marshall says this, and, and Marshall is very authentic and real. Now, here's a guy who's listed as like the top leadership guru in the world by Thinkers 50. And then he will unabashedly say, I've coached, I coached Al Mulally twice at Boeing Commercial and the Ford Motor Company. I learned more from him than he learned from me. And he means it. So, you know, you, you, we learn as much from our leaders in their situations as they learn from us. So it's that ongoing perpetual, remember, it's one of our values, you know, the, the, to be a lifelong learner. And it's, that's not a unique proposition, you know, in terms of that. Yet it's a, it's a good, people don't have to adhere to it. You know, I know, I know like, you know, as a young person, you go, oh, I'll graduate from college. I'm, I'm complete. Yeah. I, I don't have to learn anymore. No more homework. No, no more of this stuff, right? Mm, not, not really, right? It's just, it just the, the game changes in terms of, what you're doing as a student at a university, say, but it doesn't change in terms of continual learning, mm -hmm. continual reading, continual observation, continual practice and skill practice. And, um, and so, but see, that's what keeps you young. Absolutely. You know, you, you have articulated this in a way that's resonated with me more than, than what I've heard from others, which is describing stakeholder center coaching as an operating system mm -hmm. rather than like, here's a diploma, you're done, you finish, right. you have what you need, now go apply yeah. it. It's really, here's a framework for you to actually dump in a whole lot more. So tell me a little bit about how that perspective came from. Right, well, the, well, see, it came from, well, see, again, backing up a little bit. I started my professional career, I, 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 by the way, I, I didn't start right after graduating college. I didn't start right after getting my MBA from UCLA. The reason why I got my MBA at UCLA was to avoid going in the Army. So was there some professional you know, reasons or no? It was like yeah. saying Vietnam's pretty hot and heavy. Let me delay my, my entry of that. So I wasn't interested in anything besides staying out of Vietnam, Fair. right? The, the, but then when I went in the army, I looked back and I started realizing how valuable it was. And I wanted to go, the best teacher I'd ever had was this guy named John Morse. He had, when I met him, he was his first year of teaching at UCLA. He had just got out of Harvard with a DBA, equivalent of a PhD. And he was the best teacher I ever got. And he taught in the area of organizational behavior and leadership. Took all my electives from him when I was getting my MBA. When I was in the Army, I wrote to him and said, I'd like to enter the PhD program. He said, fine, I'll run interference. And by the way, pretty easy slam dunk, I got, in, I got into the program. And I show up the first day of the program. And they, one of the other two other people that started in our little part of the business school was Marshall Goldsmith, right? So that's, that's, that's a lucky falling into, 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 in with Marshall Goldsmith, right? So, but I, I decided then I wanted, both Marshall and I decided we wanted to be college professors. Mm -hmm. So we, we um, I was a little bit ahead of him. See, when, when we started the program, Marshall, he didn't have, he didn't have kids. He didn't, in fact, I don't think he and Lida were married or maybe they had just gotten married. Um, I had a wife, two kids, Right. Um, I had to start making a living. So I wanted to get through the PhD program and, and get out and make money. And Marshall was much more uh, life is, is slow. Let's go out and party. Let's uh, you know, I won't say what he was imbibing, but he was he was having a good time there. And and so I was finishing up. We started together, but I finished earlier than I got my PhD faster oh, okay. than he did. I I and and so. Um, my advisor, who was my, really my mentor at John Morris, the guy from Harvard, he says, Frank, I'll help you write your resume and send it out to college, uh, universities and stuff like that. And, and so I'm diligent. He just helped me do that. Well, fortunately, I got a minor degree outside. You had to get a minor field of study outside of the business school. So I went to the psychology department and I ended up taking a course and then became a good friend with probably the premier psychologist at, at uh, UCLA at the time a guy named Albert Morabian. And Albert Morabian is famous for his book, um, Silent Messages, which is the research on how much of communication is verbal, mm -hmm. nonverbal, right? And, and, and so um, he became a good friend. And, and so I was talking to him about it. And he said, Frank, look, I'm, in, I'm the head of this department. Every month I get a stack this high of people wanting to apply for jobs here. Only way you're gonna sell yourself, to get a job is to sell yourself personally. Mm -hmm. 
Now, I had done my undergraduate work at Santa Clara University in the south part of Silicon Valley. It's a Jesuit school, a small school. I loved my education there. And right down South Bay, you know, where I lived and where UCLA was up towards where I lived, um, there was another Jesuit school called Loyola Marymount. So I figured I'm going to try to get a, an appointment and, and meet the dean and try to sell myself. So, I, I, by the way, uh, obviously, both Marsha and I got jobs there. Uh, th that's how we started our professional career. Now, the thing is, wh when I was trying to see the dean, his assistant, who is a dear friend today, um, uh, she, um, she was running interference like she was a gatekeeper. Mm. I, I don't know how I did, but I finally got an appointment with the dean. I was his last appointment on a Friday afternoon before he was going home for the weekend. I walk into his office. Here's this guy, kind of frumpy. Um, his, his PhD was in accounting. He was an accountant, right? And, and Dean of the Business, I, I love the guy, but you know, not exactly Mr. Personable. Yeah. First thing he says to me as I walk in and sit down across from him at his big desk was, you know, there aren't any jobs here right now. Mm. And I, I already knew my answer. I said, well, I'm, I'm not here for a job. I'm here to build relationships. Mm. I want you to get to know me. And I told him about going to Santa Clara and I really prefer the Jesuit schools and that education. So the next question he asked me is, um, you know, I'm an accountant. You're in that kind of behavior area and leadership and that stuff. Can't you kind of equate anything to numbers? Mm. I'm sitting there going to myself, is that a, is that a real question? <laughs> is he serious or is he just baiting me? Mm. I, I don't even remember how I answered the question. So I, I had this interview with him, you know, half hour or so, and it's time to leave. And I go, well, thank you very much, Dean, for you know talking to me. And I'm walking out there. And he had a big office. I'm, I'm walking to the office. And I, just as I'm grabbing the doorknob, open the door, he goes, well, you know, jobs come up all the time. I go, well, okay. thank you, Dean. I thought that was interesting. I go home. That was a Friday afternoon, remember? Monday morning, I get a phone call from the head of the management side of the business school at Loyola Mama saying, come in for an interview. We have an opening. We, we need a, a part-time teacher to teach one class. Mm -hmm. We want you to interview for it. I said, great. So Tuesday, I go in. I have my interview. They say, well, we'll let, we're interviewing some other candidates. We'll let you know by the end of the week. So I go home, I go, I felt pretty good about the interview, but no, no. This is like when you interview for coaching assignments, yeah. right? Oh, it felt good, but yeah. how come I never, they never pick me? Well, Wednesday evening, Marshall calls me and he says, Frank, and this is typical of Marshall, guess where I was today? I'm going, well, let's see, what are my options? Down at the beach, boogie boarding, <laughs> um, in the back of the stacks of the graduates, I was smoking dope. Uh, he goes, no, 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 no. He always likes to play games. No, yeah. no, no, no. I say, Marshall, I have no clue where you were. He says, I was over at Loyola Marymount. As soon as he said that, I go, oh my God. Because by the way, his wife, Lida, was a, she's a PhD psychologist. She worked in the counseling center at Loyola Marymount. Oh, okay. See, I lucked into this job opportunity. Lida learned through the grapevine that they had this one time to teach us one class. So Marshall goes in for an interview. And as soon as he says that, I'm sitting to myself saying, I'm going to back out. Marshall should get this work. Gee, it'd be great if he could teach where Lida works and all that stuff. And, and, and he says, Frank, guess what the first question they asked me? I said, I don't know, Marshall. He says, how do you compare yourself to Frank Wagner? Oh, wow. What? And, and, and now Marshall, he's not Marshall trying to give me the job. He says, Frank, you got kids. You, you're, you know, you're ready to go out sooner than me. I'll back out. I'm going, no, no, Marshall. I'll back out. We're both back out. Guess what? Julius Brown, that's his name. He says, he said, I'm not going to make a choice for these two guys. I'm hiring two guys for one class. But what he did is he created another class. Oh, wow. Okay. See, he was a very popular teacher. He had 66 students in his class. He, he, he gave Marshall the one class and he brought, he traded me in. And I think for a certain reason, because, you know, Marshall has always looked older. Mm -hmm. I've always looked younger. Now, when I walked in that room with Julius Brown the first day of class, and I didn't have a class yet, um, I didn't look any older than any student sitting in the room. Mm -hmm. And Julius says, okay, uh, we've got to change here. Um, half of you are going to go with this new professor for a class. And he's basically like solid. He split the room in half and says, you all go with, with Dr. Wagner. And they went and had a class. So Marsh and I both taught a class. Um, and guess what? The school offered both of us a full-time job for the next year. So, and we had an office the size of this little hut here. 
And so our professional life was to be teachers. We both wanted to be teachers, academic professors. Then Marshall meets Paul Hersey, goes down there, tries to drag me down there. I eventually, we then become consultants. And for the first 20 years of, as consultants, we were trainers. We just did like the glorified professor, but going around in either three days or a week training leaders in real companies and getting paid a, a lot more money than a college professor. We weren't coaches, right? But then we became coaches. Now, the reason why I'm telling you this is our experience, my experience of getting a PhD, being a college professor, being a, doing leadership training and leadership development type of work as a consultant, and then starting coaching, um, I wasn't starting brand new. Oh, I started my life professionally as a coach. I had all this other background. And, and so to me, stakeholder centered coaching is like the operating system of what we do. It's, you know, it's like, you know, you know, whether you got a, 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 at least a computer that's connected to Microsoft for its operating system, or you have what you and I use, which is, which is, which are Macs, the, the, there's an operating system. It basically runs the thing. That's what stakeholder center coaching is. It's the operating system. That's what I pitch when I go to work with somebody. Um, and depending on how the conversation goes, I, they can start seeing he has more talent than just stakeholder center coaching. Mm -hmm. So like for instance, situational leadership. I use that today in my coaching my CEO with him. And, and uh, that's an application. So, so it's like your operating system is stakeholder and your other applications like, okay, you're also an expert in strength finders. Well, you may be using that in helping when you're doing your 360. You know, you're, you're an expert in neuro, neuro linguistic programming or neuroscience or any, any other thing you get trained in, you can use that as an application along with your stakeholder center coaching. And so you bring more to the table than just this methodology. But I tell you, I have a I have a fantasy though that I'd like to do because you know, Brandon, you since I've known you, you've been getting advanced degrees and doing research and that kind of stuff. But you've done the best research that I know of around around uh, perception change versus behavior change, and how it happens and when and why it happens. Well, see, I I would almost like to have somebody that that like I walk into a health club, and I take a, a someone who's a a, a instructor at a health club. He asked me, hey, did you ever go to college? No. Uh, I went to high school. I was an athlete. Now I, now I help people with their bodies and, and doing exercises. I'd say, well, I got a proposition for you where you can make a lot of money. And I don't want you to learn anything but what I'm going to teach you. And I'm only going to teach you this thing called stakeholder center coaching. You're going to, you, you, you're going to be a person. Marshall's, I, I don't know the first time when Marshall's wrote his article, it's not about the coach. I think he used the analogy. It's like we're personal trainers. Right? We don't do the coaching. It's it's the stakeholders that do the coaching, right? They're the ones who observe the person. They get influenced by them. They are impacted by them. They're with them day to day. They should be the coaches, right? And, and so we just facilitate a process. That's like a, a trainer at a gym. Now, you may have to teach them first how to do your exercises, but then once you've done that, now you're just like the, the pest mm -hmm. and the reminder, right? To do to do this thing, so so that's that's what we do. See, I want to have someone like that coach people just using signals with no other talent to bring to the table, mm -hmm. and see how well they do. What would you What would you guess if you had to hypothesize? Well, if they're a good tra see, what does a good trainer do? A good trainer person doesn't quit the gym. A good trainer they do their exercises well. They they're reaping the benefit from it. They feel they have more energy. They look better. They 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 look forward to the summertime. So I'm from Virginia, they look for summertime where they go down to the ground, the beach, and they strut around with their with their you know not quite naked bodies, but you know everyone's looking. Whoa, you know, that person looks good. So they're getting all this reinforcement. So guess what? They keep doing it. So if it, if they if a good instructor uses that a good instructor, not just any instructor, uses that same methodology with stakeholder centered coaching, I would expect phenomenal results. Mm -hmm. Because they're going to keep that leader following up with, with their stakeholders, following up in a certain way. It's not just frequency, right? I mean, we do measure at the end with the main survey how frequently did, the, did this leader follow up. We didn't say, and what was the quality of their follow-up? We just say, do they follow up? But see, a good trainer or a good coach is going to make sure those follow-ups are almost, over, at least over time, the most enjoyable thing a stakeholder has in their week mm -hmm. or their month because of the way they're treated by the leader. And see that, and, and by the way, Everything we talk about is easy to understand. It's just not easy to do. That's why I always try to just tell leaders, I'm encapsulating what I do for, your, for you is very focused and specific. 
I'm not going to make you an overall better leader. I'm not going to help you be a, a better human being. I'm not going to be help you in a, being a better business person. I'm going to help you in one aspect of your leadership. That's it. It's the only one. And so I only expect you to use what I'm telling you to do in that one aspect. So, you know, obviously one of the things we always, we, we tell people is in our methodology of stakeholders and coaching is when you ask for feedback or you ask for feedback, feed forward, the first thing you say is thank you, right? So the thing is, is I tell them, I don't care if you, you can get a ton of feedback about how you're running the business. You can get a, a bunch of feedback about, you know, the, you know, this, the new strategic plan and all that stuff. You don't have to say thank you to that. You can say, this is the stupidest idea I've ever heard. You can get defensive. You can do anything you want with that. Only when you're asking them about your goal of being a more effective delegator, collaborator, being respectful, listening, that's the only place to do it. Can we, can we agree, reach that agreement? I just compartmentalize it. Because I don't want people to kind of think, oh, this is, I got to change my life yeah. to use this thing. Yeah. So, and see, that's why, see, and a good trainer is only going to be focusing on the one mission they have, which is help the leader achieve, work well with their stakeholders, implement the action plan and 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 follow up with those you know seven twelve people that they got to follow up with every month that's all they got to do and what kind of challenges are you seeing leaders come against as they're looking to implement stakeholder center coaching um well time compression mm -hmm. the, the the thing is 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 that I, i'll go back to when just when marsh and i the first big job we had as in the consulting world, remember, we're no longer teaching at Loyola Marymount. We're going into the IBM Corporation, training mid to uh, lower level senior managers in a concept called situational leadership. IBM was the most profitable company in the world at the time. They were written up, you know, on things like Fortune magazine as the as the as the favorite company, the best company to work for. I mean, there was nothing they seemed to do wrong, and and uh, and. And this was in the like late 70s and the end of the first half of the 80s. At five o'clock at night, this huge parking lot was empty. Mm. Everybody had gone home. By the way, when we started that, I remember working, I worked with the, the guy that was tasked with putting together the first IBM personal you know, laptop. Oh, wow. And, and I, I, Apple had already come out with it. So they were behind the game on this thing. Because I mean, when they first came out, these things, typical people in the computer industry, that those were toys. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's give, but give me your little, your little son, let him play around with that thing. That's not real computing. That's not real business, right? So, so they were behind, behind the game with that. But like I say, when we started, the PC world didn't even hardly exist, right? Th things like email didn't exist, right? I mean, it, it, life was a lot easier then. You know, and the, remember, and you know what the promise of technology was? It was supposed to make our lives easier, more. Fun. Oh yeah, no, we had more free time. You could do, you know, balance our lives. And I said, mm, technology is we become the slave yeah, no to technology, way. right? <laughs> On this thing, so it's it's a you know it's a crazy world. So the biggest problem people have is, I mean, you could pump them with truth serum and say, are you committed to getting better at what you pick? Absolutely. Are you committed to following up with your stakeholders? Well, you? Absolutely. Are you willing to stick with the do's of how you do it and avoiding the don'ts of how you do it? Absolutely. I mean, they'd pass the, 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 the tests every, every time. And when a push comes to shove, other things seem to just hop in the way. Mm -hmm. So you got you to gotta deal with that. Mm -hmm. So that's why I always try to dial things back, especially with over exuberant um, managers and leaders is let's start small and build as we go. Instead of like, oh, here you got to check in with you know thirteen stakeholders. Mm -hmm. I'd say let's let's take the top se now. For, like I just I just talked today with the CEO I'm coaching. The good news is he's working on delegating effectively, and and he's only got seven direct reports. Mm. Now, by the way, when I interviewed him, I interviewed nineteen people. Yeah, wow, what a big and thing. and but see, but only seven of those were his direct reports, mm. and but everyone interacts with this guy a lot. And thank God he picked delegation because that's always a simple one of you only delegate direct reports. Everyone else, you, you know, I mean, not, not that you can't sort of uh, 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 this guy is so good that he could end up, um, you know, doing other people's work for him. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he's one of these like energizer bunnies. Mm -hmm. That, you know, it doesn't seem like which planet did he actually come from. You know, I don't know if he's really human in, in the way he operates. So, so yeah, the thing is, is that is that you can't rest on your laurels. That is going to be simple for anybody to implement our methodology. Mm -hmm. You got to assume it's going to be hard for them to put it into practice. 
So. And what do you do to, uh, so you explain this to clients up front, like, hey, this is going to take time. It's very time efficient, but you're probably going to struggle with this. What hope can you give to someone as you're delivering that same message? Well, well, see, well the first thing I do is, is I always try to give them the sense that there's the, the biggest time commitment is just right here at the beginning, and then, and then the time commitment is going to go down. Mm -hmm. So one thing, and I'm just saying, this is just Frank Wagner's personal. It's not a requirement. It's, it's not necessarily the best way. Is I always tell every leader I coach that I want to have a, you're going to check in with every stakeholder for a brief conversation once a month, as long as I'm coaching you. Is that, is that understood? Yes. How time consuming is that? Shouldn't, don't, don't look, think of it as a meeting. Think of it as a conversation. And, and, uh, and I said, the second thing is, you're going to meet with me every week. You know what? Here's the good news. It doesn't have to be a very long meeting, but we're going to meet. We're going to, let's find what is the best day and time in your calendar for us to do that. Mm. Like, for instance, the, the, this new CEO, it's at noon on Wednesdays. Mm, yeah. Is today Wednesday, Brandon? Yeah, yeah. Today is a Wednesday, right? <laughs> is it the afternoon? Yeah, it's, it's, so, yeah. So guess what? We met at noon. And, and see, but I always just say we're going to start off with that and we'll adjust as we need. Never more, but we're going to see how much we need to cut back. We can cut back. I'm amazed that every single leader I've coached, 52 weeks later, still wants to have their weekly meeting. Oh, wow, okay. But here's the thing I also do is I ensure the meeting, well, it's funny, I ensure. I am at least 99% effective that they never go over 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. They're put on the calendar. I mean, typically my meetings are Zoom, so they're put on as a 30 minute. I'm almost always finished before the 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. Every once in a while, we run over a little mm -hmm. bit. And, and sometimes it's because we're just having a, so much fun. Uh, sometimes it's because it's something important. But, but most of the time I'm done within 30 minutes. And there are many cases I'm done in after about 15 to 18 minutes. Mm. We get what needs to get done, done. I say, you need anything else? No, fine. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you another 17 minutes in your oh, life. And I, and, I, and, I, and I say, so the thing is, but, the, but they keep wanting to talk mm -hmm. and, and they see the value of it. Mm -hmm. So that's why they keep doing it. If they didn't see the value, they'd be cutting back. Oh, Frank, it's your charm. Yeah, you right. Know, I have to say, I'm a victim too. I'm happy for this interview to just keep on going. <laughs> yeah, well, well uh, thank you for that. Yeah, <laughs> so you, you're, you're good at giving, you know, good, good positive recognition there. So, well, you know, while we're here, Frank, can you tell us about this this location that we're shooting at? Because this is well, well, this is my tea house. This is in we Brand and I are sitting in the one of my garden rooms. And um, back in 1996, it's 2023, um, we bought this raw land and built our house. And, um, and, and there was just a grass field. So um, I had come up from California. I never got into gardening when I lived in Southern California. I, I'm sorry, I could, I could smell the salt air if, if the waves were big enough. And uh, I said, why would you work in a garden when you can be down at the beach? And I, under, I was a beach rat. Right, volleyball, surfing, running, doing my running on the beach, that kind of stuff. Just having fun with people in the community down on the beach. Moved up here, guess what? No beach. So you know, I, I, I went to the Japanese garden by, on a lark in here in Portland, which is one of the finest gardens in the world in Japanese gardens, and fell in love with it. So I decided to get into gardening. And I'll tell you, the Willamette Valley is one of the best places in the world to grow plants. And to have gardens, so I started with gardens. And I created garden rooms, and and uh, where we're sitting is the garden room that's the real close to a pure, authentic Japanese garden. Right behind Brandon is a little Zen garden with the rate gravel and the and the stones and and that kind of stuff. And then I've got uh, over looking where I'm pointing out in this direction, I've got a, a, a Italian garden. It looks like you know one of these formal clipped hedged gardens. That's for my wife. That's below our deck. And I have a little English garden on the far side. And then, you know, as you wrap around the front, it's kind of another big Japanese garden. So that's what, you know, I, that's what I do to, besides my formal exercises I do to stay in shape. I mean, I'm now farm, sh I always heard a term like farm strong. Those are those farm boys from Ohio that are lifting bales of hay and doing that kind of stuff. Well, you know what? Moving rocks and yeah. stuff like that and digging and that stuff out. And, trimming trees and stuff like that. Brandon's that type. I mean, he, he brought with him some change of clothes to, if he said, if I got any work to get done after we're done, let's get out there and do some, uh, some exercise. Brandon's like me. He's, he's a guy who's going to stay in shape one way or the other. They have so. to. And these rocks are big. You know, Frank, to your, to your credit, you're also not just maintaining these gardens, right? Like you started with the raw land and you right. designed and right. 
procured the materials, right. you set it up. This is this is we'll walk around and get some footage and cut it cut it in. So you do these you do these weekly sessions right. um, with this client. It's it's noon on a Wednesday. Perfect. Right. What do you do in those thirty minutes that you meet with them? Well, the first thing I do is I review my notes from last week, and you know, and, and see if there are any commitments made or deliverables of things they were going to do in the coming week. So I will have a check in with, did you get these things done? Mm-hmm. What happened? So it will be, it'll be just like asking for feedback and then feed forward. I, I want to get what happened since then. Then I'll then I'll, I'll as I transition, I you know, just pretty just standard stuff. I just ask, is there any kind of burning thing you, you want to talk about while we're here? And then, and then I'll, and then from there, if they, they'll often bring something up and, and, and because I like dealing with very specific situations that they're dealing with and, and helping them think through what they're going to do. And, and then we, and then we, you know, I always transition to, you know, what's coming up this coming week. And because I'm looking for opportunities, how it relates to their action plan in terms of that. And there's, you can always find things. Mm-hmm. And because you see, I've always see, I've got a set of notes I keep on people where I I, um, I I keep a list at the very top of this form of anything I sent them mm-hmm. and when I sent it to them because I don't have a good memory. So um, um, like for instance, the CEO asked me, "Well, Frank, I can't find the the uh, the uh, this 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 thing you described uh, the leader's guide to in, to involving stakeholders." So I, I immediately just scrolled up because I have this open on my Zoom meetings at the bottom of the page. I zoom and it says, I sent that to you on, remember today is, is, is August 30th. I said, I sent that to you on August 8th. Mm. He go, and he goes, oh, I found it. Yeah. <laughs> and then I just, I gave him some advice. I said, look, make a file called your coach's file. Mm. And anytime this is sent, if you get sent something, put it in there. Mm. So you got one place to keep it all. So, you know, so, the, I mean, those are the things I do, but get, getting back to, you know, the meetings is then I'm, I'm paying, I, I want to spend, I want to get at the end of what's coming up and, and out of this, that's where I'm building and I'm taking notes. That's where I'm getting my things I'm going to probably follow up the next week with. Mm-hmm. So I'm circling back, you know, the, the, uh, um, you know, Jathan Janoff, you know, is one of our best coaches and phenomenal guy. And by the way, he has lots of skill sets beyond stakeholder center coaching. Mm-hmm. He, um, uh, he, one of the things he created back when he was, I think, the head of a, of a law firm or a, a big section of a law firm was the same day summary. Love the same day. And, and so it, the thing is, is, there's discipline. See, my discipline is kind of unique to me. I've, I've formed my own discipline and everyone is entitled to form their own or, or by the way, creatively borrow anybody else's that works for them. I don't do same day summaries, mm-hmm. but I do my own way of uh, a similar tool mm-hmm. on that. So that's kind of how, how things work. Mm-hmm. And then, and then um, and by the way, we usually, I should say, we usually start off the meeting with just a little, a few pleasantries around, you know, well, how's your week and all that kind of stuff. And sometimes, you know, and, and they'll end up talking about, like, for instance, I'll find out that a leader, well, yeah, you know, Frank, you know, we, we didn't, we had to cancel last week's meeting because uh, it was my daughter got married. Mm-hmm. So I might start off by saying, how'd the wedding go? Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, that and and by the way, and and, and and it's funny how they'll always dovetail it back to what they're working on. This guy that I'm just I'm thinking about, which is the the the, the president of a company that I just finished this earlier this year. Um, uh, he was working on storytelling and relationship building, mm-hmm. and so he had stories to tell and relationship building things of what he did at the wedding. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so he starts. I said, "Good for you." You know, it works at work. It works. It works in other situations too. So, so, you know, I, I'm always paying attention to everything I talk about and trying to link it to what they're working on. Mm-hmm. So that's what I do is I've got to make sure that, that I'm keeping it relevant for the leader. Mm-hmm. And that's why even when it's a little bit off topic, it, 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 it's seen as not a waste of time to them. I, I'm thinking mm-hmm. it doesn't because I'm, that's, I don't get any feedback like I am. Mm-hmm. Well, all roads lead to Rome. Same with the wedding and yep. the, the storytelling. And you mentioned this this tool that we're here to talk about today, the Leader's Guide to Involving right. Stakeholders. So can you kind of set set up the context of how this tool came? Sure, sure. Well, the, the well, it's it's really one of the things when Marshall, I'll go all the way back when Marshall did his um, How a Successful Leader Gets Better. Mm-hmm. And and it was an eight, with him it was an eight step process. It was ask, listen, th- well actually ask, listen, think, think. thank. Mm-hmm. Um, then, then, then respond, involve, change, and follow up. And, 
and I, I'm, I'm sorry, my, my schooling, and I think this came out initially to me from the School of Psychology at UCLA was, was that research that shows the, the most any, at least the average human being can remember seven things. And, I'm, and, and, I, and I was saying, but Marshall's is eight, and you got to stick with what Marshall does. And, and, he, and I said, wait a minute, the involve is the other seven steps. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't need to have that step in there, right? Mm -hmm. Well, so, so uh, remember when that was taken, that was put at the top. So our leader's guide in our own, in our own coach's playbook, the first step is do's and don'ts of involving, mm -hmm. which sets up then the seventh step, ask, listen, but here's thank, think, mm -hmm. you know, then, then, then respond, change, and follow up. So it's a seventh, the, the model is actually a seven step model. Well, the leader's guide to involving stakeholders is really just all that information packaged in one source, mm -hmm. which the, you can use as a guide to the leader and then as a reference to the leader. Mm -hmm. See, so like for instance, when I'm, if I, I, the reason why I send that out right at the beginning of my coaching, once we get going, and I tell them, you don't need this right now, but this is gonna be something we're gonna be referring to a lot. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the, the CEO that I coached, when well, he remember he said he couldn't even find it, he hasn't looked at it yet. And, and so, but he didn't see part of it already because, you know, where we are now is he's, he received his 360 behavioral interview report and the, and the, the lead into that report are the do's and don'ts of thinking, mm -hmm. right? And he's, he's already told me, you know, Frank, God, these, that was so helpful to know what to avoid doing, not just what to do, but what not to do in my thing. So he, I've already got the guy, like he's drank the Kool-Aid already. <laughs> Right, but we haven't we haven't gotten to the to the, the that the, the the elements of the guide yet. Now, when we get to the elements of the guide, see the first time he the first month he's going to check in with his formal check-in with stakeholders. We are going to have one of our thirty-minute meetings is going to have a unique piece to it. Let's go through the 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 ask, listen, and thank mm -hmm. steps, the do's and the don'ts. So that's fresh on your mind. And I said, and there's nothing wrong with looking it over right before you have any one of these stakeholder meetings, isn't you're not cheating, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, exactly. I, in fact, I pref and I'm, I'm trying to give a little plug of, if you can't remember what not to do, just look at your guide right before you have your yeah. meeting with them, yeah. right, type of thing. And so the, the way that it's set up is, there's seven steps, but they really fall into, th into three chunks. Mm -hmm. and, and the first chunk are the th first three steps of ask, listen, and thank. That's what you do in a, in a um, check-in with a stakeholder, a follow-up with a stakeholder. You're asking around both your goal and your action plan, how you're doing and any thoughts on how I could do it better in the next 30 days. You're listening to, you know, gee, if you ask somebody for to say something, they expect you to listen. Well, you guess let's, let's truly listen and really listen well and avoid the don'ts and do the do's. And then wh whatever they say, you say, thank you. Mm -hmm. and, 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 uh, and see, that's where I differ. Marshall says you think and then you yeah. think. Uh, and and he, the reason why he does that, I understand tell you why he does it. He does it because of the story he tells about, about um, he, he's in the car with his wife, Lida, and he's driving and, and, oh, yeah. and, she, and she gives him the comment, there's a red light up there. And, and, uh, and, and now Marshall is smart enough that within a nanosecond, he can do a cost benefit analysis and realize she's absolutely right. And he should turn to her and say, thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, is that what he said to her? No, um, but see, that's the whole thing is, I believe the knee jerk reaction to a leader, anytime they're getting feedback or feed forward, it's a gift and you say thank you mm -hmm. for the gift. You don't have to like the gift, mm -hmm. right? You can re-gift it. Mm -hmm. You can do anything you want with it afterwards, but it's very important to reinforce the process that this person is giving you their thoughts. You know, they're, they're, that, that's valuable. Mm -hmm. In fact, in some cases, invaluable. Mm -hmm. So that's why it, you know, it's those three steps. So see, I will be reinforcing those three steps every month before the leaders, it's time, you know, as they're checking with their stakeholders. Or by, I'll debrief it, you know, we'll be looking backwards or do an AAR. Okay, you had your me meeting with two, your two key stakeholders to this, this week. Um, how'd you do on the do's and the don'ts? Mm. I'll have them talk to me about it, right? And see, what I'm really looking for is not the, oh my God, I messed up, you know, I think I got a little defensive or, or I forgot to say thank you. And I'll say, okay, what do you, you know, what are you gonna do next time? And, you know, I don't beat them up. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, they do a good job. It gives me an opportunity to say, thank you for doing this. Mm -hmm. You're doing a really good job. So I can, I can, as a coach, be reinforcing it also. I wanna hear success stories mm -hmm. as they go through this thing. So, so the, you know, and then by the way, the, the, the think and respond, those aren't, aren't just for the, when they got the 360 at the beginning, it's every time they come in, they say, you know, Frank, I got a, 
you know, I got this suggestion from somebody. And the just way they say suggestion, I'm yeah. going, ooh, I guess they probably don't think it's the world's greatest uh, idea. Let's talk about it. So then we'll we'll spend maybe we'll carve out a good bit of that 30 minute call on that issue or what that person suggested. And again, and I'll tell them too, is at the end, is it look, we don't have to make a decision. You don't have to make a decision right now. Mm -hmm. Mull this over, right? In terms of that and come back and by the way, sometimes they come back and now they're much more eloquent at explaining why it's not the right thing for them to do to that person. Or it may be I was wrong, I think this is worth implementing. And, and see, the one thing I always do where I love what we do once we get into the actual work is, see, they know who gave them the suggestion. The person gave you, Brandon gave me the suggestion. I go, okay, and by, I'm the coach. I know that Brandon gave the suggestion. I might say, remember the thing you rejected as an idea, right? The Brandon suggestion to the whole team. How about just doing it with Brandon? Mm -hmm. See how it works. And, and I'm, I'm baiting them to do it and say, wait a minute, maybe it's better not just for Brandon. Mm -hmm. But also, even if it's only right for Brandon, um, how does Brandon feel? So, you know, the, the thing is, is that, is that, you know, we are, we, our whole process to help leaders be better influencers, guess what? As a good coach, you got to be a good influencer. Mm -hmm. So it's like how you kind of phrase things and set up little situations. And see, I always like the old try it out before you commit to it type yeah. of stuff. You know, the, the, my, my great colleague who is Marshall, my, you know, major business owner, partner at Kilty Goals from the Boone, um, Joe Kilty, he was the first person I heard him doing this in front of a group of senior leaders talking about the puppy dog clothes. Have you ever heard of the puppy dog clothes? Remind me. The puppy dog clothes is, the technical term in sales is called a trial clothes. Mm -hmm. but, but he uses the analogy of a, of a puppy dog. This is, this is how it goes. He goes, okay, you're married. Um, you want to go to the shopping mall and, and your spouse says, could you take the kids? And you say, ah, okay. Right? And, 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 you, and, and you got some things you want to get there. You get to the shopping mall, you know what the kids want to do? There's a pet store. They want to, they want to go and spend time in the pet store. So, so you, you, know, you take them to the pet store, but then you say, um, look, I got to just run next door to the sporting goods store or whatever, or the men's clothing store or the, or the women's clothing store if I'm a woman. And, 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 uh, and, 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 and there's a little playpen area or a, like a petting area where, in fact, your kids are in there playing, petting the little puppies and, and the ch little chicken -dee things and all that stuff like that. And so you, you just say to the owner, look, I'm going to be gone for about five minutes. He's all right, my kid just there. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So you go, you get your stuff, you come back in and there's your, like, your daughter and she's holding the most adorable little puppy. The puppy's <laughs> licking, licking her like this. She's got that, talk about puppy dog, she got those eyes, daddy. Can we take this oh, puppy home? Busted. God, I will love you for the rest of my life. If we can take this puppy home, I'll never ask for anything again in my life if I can have this puppy. And you're going, I'll get killed if we get this puppy. Now, as just as you're about trying to figure out what you're going to do here, the, the, the owner of the, of the pet store comes in, puts his arm over your shoulder, and he says, Frank. Like, how does he know we get to Frank? <laughs> I can see you're in a really tough situation. And by the way, there's all, every other patron in this shopper in the store is rooting for the little girl again, the puppy dog. He says, look, you look like an honest guy. I'm going to, I've got a proposition for you. Look, you could take the puppy home tonight and bring it back in the morning. Mm -hmm. That's the puppy dog clothes. Mm -hmm. right? In other words, you don't have to keep the puppy. Just take it home for the night. Try it out. And the question is, how likely is that dog to stay in that house after being brought home? See, it's, it's called a, the, the technical term is a trial closes. See, people resist being forced that I've got to go through this life changing event right now, mm. you know, to, do, to make this change. No, no, try it out for a day. See if it works. Mm. Try it for a week. See if it works. I try it with one stakeholder. That's try it with one stakeholder and see if it works. Way. See, that's, that's what, see, Marshall's, a lot of the stuff that Marshall comes up with that he invents, he always tries it out with, say, like a major CEO, a major corporation for a week. Mm. So like when he started doing, you know, he himself has done daily checklists for 30 years. When he say he's done it, he's had someone call him. I mean, he's too, he says, I'm too weak to do it myself, but I have somebody call me mm -hmm. to do it with me. But he does it religiously, right? Um, he'll want a, a, a CEO to try a daily checklist. He says, try it for a week. Mm -hmm. I remember the first time he, he had another great thing, um, you know, adding too much value. He, I remember him calling me up right after he did it. He was the first CEO he did it with. He, 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 called, he had the CEO and he said, Look, I want you to try something for a week, one week. Every time you're about to open your mouth at work, before you open the mouth and say anything, 
just ask yourself this question. Is this worth saying? Mm-hmm. Would you do that? What CEO said, yes, I'll do that. Now, do the CEO do that every single conference? I doubt it. But do they do it a whole lot during that week? Because it's only a week? Yes, and Marshall. Thinking. So the week comes up, Marshall calls on and says, Well, did you, you know, do what I said? He said, Yes. Well, what were the results? This is what he's telling me. He's just he's just so happy to tell me about this. He goes, he goes, Oh, um, uh, you know what the CEO said? 50% of what I was going to say wasn't worth saying. Wow. 50%. So I'm thinking, well, that, that's interesting, but you can't make any inferences on one data point, right? Sure. One per- Marshall did it four more times in, in a, over a number of months, eerily got the same answer. Mm-hmm. Five CEOs, 50% of what I said isn't worth saying. So the thing is, is, you know, do we have to start learning how to, you know, put a little governor on our, let's like, see, if Marshall said try that for like a month, yeah. no, yeah. No, way. no way, wouldn't have happened. So, I mean, incremental change, mm-hmm. that's what we're after. Well, you've talked about the <clears throat> the value of reinforcing the process of a stakeholder saying, hey, got feed forward to you. And that if you don't, even if it's a bad suggestion, you're essentially telling them it's not worth your time or mine for you to give this. What do you think happens if you're not reinforcing that process? What's the danger of a leader not taking that advice to heart? Well, we'll see. That that's the thing is, is you've got to be... I, I I refer to myself with my most of the people I coach at some point in time is it's your pest calling, you, <laughs> right? Re- repetition, repetition, mm-hmm. repetition. Do your push ups, do your chin ups, right? Do your sit ups, you know, do your exercises, do your follow ups, do the do's, avoid the don'ts. Mm-hmm. See, I want to get th- that's the realization I came to. I remember when I first got started, I I personally was worried. I got to make sure this leader picks the right goal to work on. Mm-hmm. You could throw a, a dart board at a wall. You could, in other words, you could, you could say, I, I could go to a leader. I hadn't done this, but I've always thought about it. They get this big report. Here's your strengths. Here's your, here's your, your things you could work on to get better. I said, the only thing off limit is you can't work on anything that someone said you need to get better at. Mm-hmm. You, 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 you got to pick something to get better. But it's got, by the way, if you quote to me, it's got to be something about leadership and behavior. But, but picks anything besides what everyone thinks you should work on. The process is more important than the goal. Mm-hmm. See, if they, that the habit that gets for is someone gets very good at saying thank you beyond just the actual goal and action plan they're working on to get better, but they start saying thank you much more frequently on lots of other things, right? They, they're reflective. They don't react too quickly. I mean, they think about things. They, they respond in a, in a number, whether it's asking or responding, there's pretty much the same dues of being, you know, clear, concise, and positive mm-hmm. in, in the way you talk about things and you present things. You know, th- those skills are transferable to just about everything they do. Mm-hmm. And when those become the habits, yeah. that's the value. Because see, that, that I mean, just because someone got better at a particular aspect of their own leadership, that doesn't, to me, change relationships. It's, the, it's that process of how they're interacting with their stakeholders changes the relationship. Mm-hmm. So that's why I mean I, I you know when when people ask me what I do on an airplane I haven't done it too much since COVID but when I used to be on a plane you know two three even sometimes four times in, in a month um, people would always ask you know at some point in time they'd ask you know what do you do right. and and uh, I used to just say um, well by the way oh, I'm a teacher mm-hmm. oh what do you teach high school no <laughs> no I, I teach you know leaders in big companies and so like that. but then when I got into you know, more coaching I would say well I'm a coach and is it oh you know what the most common because of the way most people's view of uh, our relationship to hearing about coach oh are you a life coach oh okay I get I get a life coach is it no no I'm not a life coach right and then I, I slowly get let me describe what I do and then they go oh okay I see what you do but then I, a few times I've had fun, I actually say, I'm a relationship coach. Mm-hmm. And I say, oh, you're a li-. I'll actually say that. And then they'll say, because um, they never say anything, they haven't guessed yet mm-hmm. about what kind of coach I say. I say I'm a relationship coach. So they say, oh, yeah, you're one of those life coaches. And I say, well, I I'm not so sure about that. And then I explain, they was, oh, no, I don't think you're what mm-hmm. I was thinking Yeah, in terms of that. Yeah. You know, when they, they when I talk about the kinds of situations I'm coaching and the kinds of people I'm coaching, they don't see it. But it's actually true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're a habits coach. Yeah. To help people develop stakeholder centered habits. Yep. Yep. Um, so how does this tool help help? Yeah. We, we've already ta- already you already brought thank you for bringing it back up. I was I I use it that you know I'm I'm heavily using those 
that what's in the leader's guide, remember, not the whole guide, it's the section of the guide. The way it's set up is it, it, it first of all, lays the groundwork about when coaching doesn't work, what are the principles of stakeholders in your coaching? All that. They, they have that, that's the preface. But the important thing is once you get to the section that, that covers the do's and don'ts of the seven um, virtuous cycle of how you follow up and involve stakeholders. And, and so the first three, I'm constantly reinforcing when it's time to check in with their followers, with their, with their stakeholders, and or right after they've checked in with, and followed up with their, with their um, stakeholders. But the, and then the, the think and the respond are things that also I reinforce when that's the task they're at. So like, for instance, when someone, I, I used an example earlier where someone is, is um, got a suggestion they really didn't buy into. And in the conversation, I'm getting them to think about it. And so I'm asking, you know, kind of cost benefit questions and, and, and what ifs and, and uh, you know, but also, you know, from the, the upside and the downside of, 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 of implementing it. And then, I, and then I just give them time to think more about it. Before they actually get back to people, I'd say, I'd like to hear how you're going to respond to them. Mm -hmm. So we have a conversation. Sometimes it ends up being a rehearsal. Sometimes it isn't. I gauge whether or not a person actually needs pure behavioral rehearsal or not. Actually, a lot of the people I've coached are, are senior enough that they are pretty well, they know how to rehearse themselves. They've been in front of cameras, that kind of stuff. Um, although not all of them. And some people are naturals. Mm -hmm. I, you give them something, they, they think about it, and they're very good at responding. Others, mm, you don't hold your breath mm -hmm. uh, the way and how they're going to respond. So, uh, so I, I, that's what I'm bringing them back to that guide saying, you know, please don't forget, just go to these pages in your leader's guide mm -hmm. and just review them quickly. So I'm, I'm always reinforcing, use the guide, right? And then, and then, and then, you know, and then the, the same thing with change and follow up that those two are linked together. It, it's not just change because, because remember, it's not just you changing is they're changing their perception. Mm -hmm. What's the, the only way you, you have any validation in the change of perception is by checking in with them. Right. What did you notice? Mm -hmm. What have I done? Right. You know, I mean, you know, what am I, you know, I, I can't, I always remember this one example. This is a guy, he, unfortunately he died quite a few years ago now, but um, when I met him, he, he was bragging that earlier he had had martial goals with his coach. And he says, and I'm famous for martial goals coaching me. He says, because I had the best excuse Marshall said anyone's ever given. <laughs> he, he said, I blame God. Oh, okay. <laughs> and 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 then this guy was fabulous. His name was, was John Rose. I can I'm free, even before he died. I could he, I, he he let me talk about him. He started a thing called the East West Institute, which mm -hmm. was founded in Beirut back when Beirut was a good, a pearl of a city, and um, and the big issue on the planet was not global warming or 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 you know what else is going on. It was the it was the Cold War and the threat of a nuclear disaster between the Soviet Union and the U.S. So he, with another guy, started a thing called the East-West Institute to try to manage the relationships between the Soviet Union and the United States. And, and they were engaged in what's called track two diplomacy, which I'd never heard of. What's track two diplomacy? Well, you know, the, the track one diplomacy is ambassadors. So there'll be a, like a you know, Russian ambassador to the United States and vice versa and you know China and all these places like that. Track two diplomacy is is going through the network of, of uh, you know, almost say like oh, if I use a bad modern example, if I was trying to do with Russia, it would be with oligarchs. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you, and you use those channels to get the right things to happen. Oh, wow. And their field was, was tracked to diplomacy. And in fact, when the Berlin Wall came down, um, John Burroughs got the highest award Germany would give to a non-German because of their role, you know, behind the scenes through track two diplomacy to make their Ber Berlin Wall come down, and and so uh, I mean, he was a fabulous guy. But now, getting back to when I was coaching him, I do my interviews, and and uh, and it's very clear what people said. He's too demanding. Mm -hmm. John Rose is one of these guys that, you know, whether it's a curse or a blessing, could get by on two to four hours of sleep a night. His his metabolism was at about 150 percent, and he had a number of wealthy donors that gave lots of money to the East West Institute. Um, but uh, this is an example: um, a 
uh, I won't mention the person who's who's going to give the money would say, John, I'll give you another million dollars um, towards your what you're doing. You know, besides all the money I've given you, but you have to match it. Mm. So then John would go back to his development staff and say, we got to raise another million dollars. Mm. Now, the development staff would be saying, oh, my God, I'm working at a, I can't go at 150%, but I'm going at 125%. I'm just about dying. And there's, I, you can't bleed any more blood out of the stone. And so the whole issue about John Morose was he doesn't say ever say no. Mm. He only says yes. So that's it. That was actually his goal, saying no. Now, John, <laughs> um, every year would hire a an assistant right out of like one of the top um, Ivy League schools. So like this particular year was a young person from Yale. This person would carry John's bags and literally was attached to the hip to John except for at nighttime and sleep. Mm. So he's with them basically seven by almost seven by 24. So he ends and he's one of the stakeholders, right? For John saying no. So John says he's no, he's got his action plan, shared with his people. It's his first month of checking in. So he gets to the point of asking his like little attache assistant, um, how am I doing saying no? Young kid looks at him and says, um, yeah, you're still not saying no. You're only saying yes. Mm. Well, I don't know whether he did this or not, but he said, Frank, I bit my tongue and, and I think I said, thank you. He calls me up. He is screaming over the phone. <laughs> He's saying, I said, no, I said, no. And, and this kid said, I didn't say no and blah, blah, blah. And blah. Okay. Stop spitting, John. Take a breath. You said, you said, no. Could you give me a couple of examples? He said, I can give you three examples. He gave me very clear examples. I said, why don't you go back to this young boy and say, I want to review last week, um, and I don't think I was clear enough. I'm going to describe three situations. I want to know how I'm doing. Bum, situation, yes, you said no. The young kid, yes, you know. Bum, did I say no? Yes, you said no. Bum, did you say no? You know what the kid said? I guess you are changing. <laughs> uh -huh. Right? So the, the, thing, the thing is, is that, see, a lot of times, People just aren't specific enough because, mm -hmm. you know, it's so hard. It's so hard to change perception. Mm -hmm. Confirmation bias. John Rose is a guy that always says yes, never says no. I, I just somehow ignore. I'm right there in a room with him and he's saying no to somebody and I, I don't pick up on it. Mm -hmm. So you got to be blatantly obvious mm -hmm. in what you're doing. So, you know, the thing is, is that is, you know, just reinforcing, you know, the, the change process is hard. But you see, it's not just changing you, changing them also. Mm -hmm. So that's why, you know, that, that, that whole, what are you doing in terms of your changing? What are you doing in terms of your follow-up? It just keeps that virtuous cycle going. So I, I don't want to have them say, review the whole cycle. I think the value in, the, in this leader's guide and using it as a coach is to, is to use the section of the steps that are relevant for what you're talking about. Mm. And you can point to those specific pages. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So I'm a coach. I'm listening to this, this episode. I think I got to get that resource. I download it. How do I use it with my client this week? Okay. Well, well, the, f the first thing you got to do to use it is, is, is not be a card player. You're all, you're keeping all, all the cards yourself. Mm. You got to send them a copy. Okay. So send a copy right to the client. Yeah. Right? And, and just say, this, this is a methodology. This is a tool we're going to be using. And, um, and so the, you know, the thing is, is that, is that, um, by the way, you can even give them the advance. See, I give advance warning and I, and I tell them to, to, to have it available, right? Because I mean, they can print out a copy. Even if they do, that doesn't mean delete the, the copy that's on their computer. So if you're talking with them on a computer, you'll say, open up the file, open up the, the your leader's guide. After a while, they're going to know mm -hmm. that's coming. At the first, it's, oh, where is it? I can't find it. And it was like, if I'd asked the CEO to open up the leader's guide, send it to you early in the month, they'd go, uh, uh, you know, it would have taken up some time. I would have still found it and got him to open it because I I could go back and say I sent you on this date, and he, he I don't know whether that was what did it or not, but he had immediately found it. Mm. And um, and by the way, if someone can't find it, say here it is. Mm. You just look for it. I, I've just sent it to you. Mm. I want them to have a copy of this thing, and they know we're going to use it. Mm -hmm. So that I mean, once you train them, they know what to expect. Such a nice thing about meeting on Zoom as well, because you know that they're going into their inbox or their right. calendar for a meeting link. It's like, I'm going to send you the resource five minutes before the session. So as soon as you log in, hey, you're at your computer, open up your inbox. It's right, right at the top. There's right. no excuses for us not to align 
on the stuff. Yeah. Get. And by the way, see, in my preparation, I always don't do my any I do my best not to have any calls just back to back, especially my coaching calls, because I want at least 15 minutes to get ready for the call. Yeah. And if I, have to, if I have to hop off and do something else, I'll have taken school as notes. I won't capture my notes in my little document to keep track of things until after this next meeting I've had. But before the meeting, I want to have time to review things. And for instance, I'll have my copy of the, of the Leader's Guide to Influence not only open, but I'll have it scroll to page 38, which is where I wanted to go. Mm. So I have to remember that. And I'll just say, okay, open your document, scroll to page 38. Mm -hmm. Now we both have the same. Now you can share screen and, and do the work from, I don't want, I want them to get the tactical experience of knowing where their guide is, opening their guide, using their guide. Mm -hmm. And I just assume that the, the, the Zoom meeting is where we can see each other. Mm -hmm. So I don't like to do share screen. That's okay. my personal preference. Mm -hmm. Now you may say, I'm not Frank Wagner and I think that works better. Fine. It's not a requirement. Mm -hmm. And if it does work better for you, don't do my advice. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I should back up. First step is to familiarize myself with the resource. Right. Second is to send it to the client and then make sure that they've got it open during the session so I can point to a specific Yeah. Page. And if, if we're going to be using it that day. If we're using now, it. But, but I will always have at least open my computer or uh, to open almost every time before a coaching meeting, just in case I want to refer to it. I'm just saying, see, to me, the most important thing I do as a coach is get them to have the habit of using the seven-step process. Mm -hmm. That's my main focus mm -hmm. for coaching. So to me, that's the best tool we got. Frank, if I'm a certified coach and I get this, uh, this download this tool, how much additional information do I need in order to fully understand? Well, I mean, for people that are, that are coaches, you have everything once you've gone through the our, pro, our process. You've got the coach's playbook, which you got early on. What you're probably not doing is relying on it enough or reviewing it enough times. Because everything you fundamentally need, every step along the way of coaching a leader from beginning to being introduced to them about stakeholder center coaching, contracting with them, helping them in terms of, of uh, picking what they're going to work on, helping with the building of an action plan, helping them with the what we, we've been talking about, the Leader's Guide to, to Involving Stokers. You're helping them with how they go about following up with their stakeholders. It's all there, which you don't realize it's there. Spend your time getting, continually being familiar. You can almost go to the page in the, in the Poacher's Playbook. If you do that, you've got everything you need. You can't say, well, what else are you? What else? No. Once you have that you're, and you coach people using that, you'll know you don't need anything else. Mm -hmm. you, you're there. Um, and, and, the, and again, see, that's your kind of, I don't know, Bible when it comes to behavioral coaching. It's not your Bible for any kind of spiritual or religious belief. The, the same thing for a leader that you're coaching, your client, is their Bible is going to be that leader's guide to involving stakeholders. That's what they need to know and to practice and and eventually become habitual where it's almost you know you can it's in their subconscious routine they can rely on it you know for the rest of their life so that's that, that's for people that are are certified coaches coaches in our network if you're watching this and that's not where you are um i i can give you two public domain resources that are probably the best to get a little bit better working familiarity with that. Um, both have been written by Marshall Goldsmith. One is Coaching for Behavior Change, uh, probably, I think, available on his website. Um, the other one is Team Building Without Time Wasting, which he wrote with Howard Morgan. Both of those give you a really good feel for, number one, how you do individual coaching, and the team building without time wasting is how it applies to teams, working with teams. So, you know, I, I was, and then if you if those all intrigue you, keep exploring. Talk to coaches that, that are certified in stakeholder center coaching. Talk to go to our website, get a conversation, see if this is right for you, that you want to add it to your level of expertise in the coaching you want to provide. So, Frank, if I am a leader, I'm listening to this conversation, I'm thinking, you know, I've got that one behavior that people have told me I should change. I'm aware I should change it. I want to change it. I'm just not sure what to do, where to start, where to go. What advice would you have for that leader? Um, good question, because, you know, inertia is the 
best predictor of what people are going to be doing next is what they're doing now. And if if you're thinking about wanting to change behavior as a leader, um, probably a week from now, you'll be thinking about changing behavior as a leader, right? You, you, you got you, you got to change the pattern, right? You got to you got to change the momentum. And best advice I could give is think through what are the things that are holding me back. Uh, one thing that's in our literature, um, I didn't talk about in this meeting at all, are kind of I'd say our our kind of golden virtues of leadership in general and specifically when you're trying to improve yourself as a leader using stakeholders and coaching is courage, humility, and discipline. So if you if you are thinking about improving as a leader and you have the courage to do it, you have the humility to do it, and you got the discipline to do it, irrelevant. You'd be already doing it. So which of those is holding you back? You know, I'd like you to think through is it that eh, nah, it's not courage. I don't have the courage is I'm not humble enough. I just, you know, I, I think that, that uh, I, in fact, I, I have trouble with humility. Yeah, well, then guess what? That's what's holding you back. You, know, you got to think about, you know, maybe practicing a little humility first before you can implement this. You know, on the other hand, you may be plenty humble and it is the courage part. You're scared. You're afraid to do this thing. Well, guess what? Most people don't jump in and do something they're really scared or afraid about. So, you know, that's the thing you got to start thinking about. What do I need to do to start building my courage to do that. And finally, you may say, it's not a courage issue. It's not a humility process. I just, I know I'm totally undisciplined. You know, I know it'll fall apart. So why waste my time to even get started? Well, without discipline, it's not going to work for you. So the good news is you don't have to be world-class at any one of those three, right? And certainly not all three of those three. You've got to have enough of those. And so, you know, and, and by the way, maybe you want to do a little research with people is, getting their opinion on you on each of those three areas. You may be surprised yourself that you could have, you have what it takes.